Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us at this event as part of the ADB's 55th annual meeting. My name is Teresa Ko and I am the Director General of the East Asia Department. It is truly my pleasure to be your moderator for this session. Today, we are launching two key publications that promote transparent reporting of climate-related risks and opportunities and advance sustainability of ADB organizational and operational activities. The inaugural Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures Report, or the TCFD Report, and the 2022 Sustainability Report. The format of the event this afternoon will start with opening remarks from Vice President for Finance and Risk Management, Ms. Roberta Casali. This will be followed by two short presentations on the ADB Sustainability Report and on the ADB's first TCFD Report. We will then have a moderated panel discussion before concluding the event with remarks from Vice President for Corporate Management and Administration, Mr. Bruce Gosper. To open the event, I would like to invite Ms. Roberta Casali, Vice President for Finance and Risk Management, to make some introductory remarks. Roberta is responsible for the oversight of the Office of Risk Management, the Controller's Department, and the Treasury Department. Prior to ADB, she was the Director of the Corporate and Investment Banking Division at Intesa San Paolo and Payment System and Oversight Regulation Director at Banca d'Italia. Roberta, with that, it is now over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you, Teresa. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the joint launch of the 2022 Sustainability Report and of the inaugural ADB's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, so-called TCFD Report. The TCFD Report enriches ADB's existing disclosure on its corporate sustainability performance and it's a big milestone for the bank, underscoring the importance of climate change to our development agenda. In recognizing that the sustainable financial market can only grow with consistent and standardized reporting, ADB became a strong supporter of the Financial Stability Board, TCFD, in 2021. Since then, we took serious efforts in implementing the C TCFD recommendations. This report increases financial transparency on ADB's climate change-related risks and opportunities. It also illustrates the enhancements ADB has made on climate change related issues and risks. It's centered on four pillars, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. Just this year, we set up the Climate Action Coordination Committee, a senior leadership group that oversees the planning, implementation, monitoring, and coordination of ADB's actions to meet its climate goals. ADB has built a range of processes for analyzing and managing climate risks. Let me highlight three of them. First, we have a framework for climate risks appraisal and management embedded in projects. Second, we include our climate risk analysis in our credit risk assessments for both sovereign and non-sovereign operations. And finally, we have climate-based filter criteria for liquidity investments. The publication is the result of a fantastic one ADB effort co-led by our Office of Risk Management 
and the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, of which I'm really proud. We intend to keep strengthening our alignment with the TCFD recommendations and foster a culture that recognizes risks and opportunities for climate change challenges and sustainability efforts throughout ADB. Thank you all. I wish a fruitful discussion today at the panel and back to you, uh, Teresa. Thanks. Thank you, Roberta, for those opening remarks. Now, the next two speakers will give us a quick overview of the two reports. First up, may I call on Mr. Duncan Lang, Senior Environment Specialist in the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, to walk us through ADB's 2022 Sustainability Report. Thank you very much, E.G. Teresa. So it's a great pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the Sustainability Report. Um, it is now live, so please feel free to go to our website and download it. Um, I can say it's uh, a real honor for me to do this, but I have a big team of people who've helped me as part of this journey to get the report down, done. So thanks to them as part of the, the work that they did uh, in preparation and for our management as well. Um, you may notice on the front of our cover that we have a, a, a plant there, which is very similar to the coronavirus. Um, this is on purpose. This plant is called the Bankal. And really what we try and do when we do the sustainability report is try and tell a story of what we've been doing over the last couple of years. And so that has really been the story of ADB, how we've responded to the COVID pandemic and also how we've dealt with the green, inclusive and resilient recovery. So it's really been telling that story from the operations and corporate side. Um, next slide, please. So why does ADB do sustainability reporting? Well, uh, we are not alone. 93% of the world's largest companies do sustainability reporting. Also our peers in the other developer member uh, MDBs, they also do it. We've got the World Bank, EIB, EBRD as well, and it's underpinned Sustainable Development Goal 12. Uh, we follow a system of reporting called the GRI, uh, and that came about back in 1997 as a result of the Exxon Valdez disaster, where there was a need for accountability and transparency in um, corporate activities. And it's really morphed over time, the GRI, into becoming a really globally well-known benchmarking uh, system uh, for sustainability reporting. Next slide, please. So the way we set up at ADB for our sustainability report is uh, we have two publications, we have a highlights report and the Global Reporting Initiative Index. We've been producing the report since 2007, so this is actually now our ninth uh, publication. And the reason we do it is it's really important for us to provide a central uh, globally recognized benchmarking mechanism for us to transparently share with our stakeholders all of the information about our sustainability performance. We include both the operational side but also importantly, the corporate side. And this is the only publication where we're able to do that. The audience for ADB uh, with our sustainability report is quite varied. We have our internal stakeholders, but also external. We have ESG rating agencies who are interested in what we do, uh, green and blue bond investors. Uh, and we've heard a lot from the civil society at the ADB uh, AGM. And it's very important mechanism for us to get information to them, as well as information to our developing member countries and to our donor countries as well. Next slide, please. So the report, as I said, comes in two parts. We've got this highlights report, and that's really where we can give information on uh, things like our human resources. We've got some information there on, say, the diversity of our workforce, but also on our resources management. We've got information on our emissions, our um, electricity usage, waste, water usage, and all that information is there. Next slide, please. And to supplement that, we have the GRI index. And for anybody who really wants to delve into what ADB does in great detail, this report 
gives all that detail. It's a one-stop shop to what we do from a, a ESG perspective. We try to do it in a way that is readable to everybody, but also uh, gives uh, the detail there. So there's a lot of infographics, a lot of uh, tables with data there that people can use and take away. Next slide, please. So lastly, well, how are we doing on a sustainability front? Well, the answer is fairly well. Um, this is from independent third parties that rate ADB. Uh, we've got a few listed down there. I won't go into the details, but we do fairly well. I would say there's still room for improvement. We are, as an example, double A rated. We would love to become triple A rated, uh, but we are moving in the right direction. We also have great um, edge certification in terms of our gender equality, and we do pretty well with aid transparency. Um, one of the things that has in the past let us, let us down slightly is the fact that we don't uh, do the TCFD report. So that gives me an opportunity to say thanks and segue over to our next speaker. So back to you, TG Teresa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Duncan. That was very informative. Next, we have Ms. Sopan Hassa, Risk Management Specialist from the Office of Risk Management, to tell us a little bit more about our inaugural TCFD report. Thank you, Teresa. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure today to introduce you with the first Asian Development Bank's report on climate-related financial disclosure. So the report is already, you can already download the report on our website. So this publication provides an overview on the progress that the bank has made in implementing the TCFD recommendations. It also presents future action for further alignment. Next slide, please. I will not spend too much time on explaining what the TCFD is because we are the owner of the presence of Ms. Laur Liansim, Vice Chair of the TCFD, in the panel discussion right after my presentation. So very briefly, TCFD stands for the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. And it was created to increase and to improve the reporting of climate-related financial information. As of today, many organizations, including multilateral development banks and government, are supporting this initiative. The Asian Development Bank also joined this group last year in November. Next slide, please. Reporting under the TCFD reports has several benefits to ADB and to our stakeholders. It also supports the ADB commitment in our strategy 2030 and for the full alignment to the Paris Agreement. It also serves risk management purposes. Reporting under the TCFD recommendations also increase ADB's transparency on climate-related risk and opportunities as being the climate bank for the Asia and the Pacific regions. Following the TCFD recommendation, the first ADB TCFD report is structured in four thematic pillars, which, are, which describe how the organizations operate and which are interrelated, the governance, the strategy, the risk management, and the metrics and targets pillar. Next slide, please. In the governance pillar, the report disclosed the oversight of climate-related issues by the bank and the management, including the climate-related policy and the framework in place. In the strategy pillar, the reports describe how climate considerations are embedded within our organizational strategies and our operational approaches. Next slide, please. In the risk management pillar, the reports describe the processes and the tool that we have put in place to assess and to manage the climate risk at the operations and also at the organization level. Finally, in the metrics and the targets pillar, the reports disclose some information on our greenhouse gas, gas emissions from our internal operations and on our climate finance targets and the progress towards meeting these targets. There is also a high level of a high level analysis of the exposure of the uh, portfolio of the bank to climate change, and this includes an industry sector climate sensitivity heat map. The first TCFD reports cover many other areas in this four thematic pillar. It also highlights ongoing initiative and future actions that support the crucial role of the bank as the climate bank for the Asia and the Pacific regions, and also to further align with the TCFD recommendations. And this include the development of the climate change 
action plan that will continue to embed climate into our operations. Next slide, please. If you want to learn more about this inaugural TCFD report and about the latest sustainability report, please visit our website. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to panel discussions. Back to you, Teresa. Thank you, Sopanha. Now we will dive into the discussion to delve deeper into how TCFD alignment enhances financial transparency related to climate risks and opportunities. We are joined by exceptional panelists who will share their in reflections and information on ADB's experience as the climate bank in Asia and the Pacific and share their insights on the benefits of adopting TCFD recommendations. Before I turn to each of the panelists, it is my honor to introduce them all. First, we have Ms. Yo Lian Sim. Ms. Yo is Vice Chair of TCFD and a member of the Sustainability and Climate Change Committee of the Institute of Singapore Chartered Accountants. She is Special Advisor on Diversity at Singapore Exchange after 10 years as Head of Regulation and Risk Management. In charities, she is Executive Director of Shared Services for Charities Limited, a charity that helps other charities in governance. Secondly, we have New Zealand Minister, Honorable Alpito William Sio. Mr. Sio is the Minister for Pacific Peoples and Minister for Courts. He is also the Associate Minister of Foreign Affairs, Associate Minister of Education for Pacific Peoples, Associate Minister of Justice, and Associate Minister of Health for Pacific Peoples. He has been an elected member of parliament for the Manguri electorate since 2008. Third, we have Mr. Bruno Carrasco. Mr. Carrasco is the Director General of the Sustainability, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department of ADB, which provides leadership, innovation, and knowledge sharing for the bank's sector and thematic work. Mr. Carrasco is concurrently Chief Compliance Officer. Last but not the least, we have Mr. Stephen O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary is the head of ADB's Office of Risk Management and has more than 30 years of experience in banking, spanning client coverage, trade finance, portfolio management, and risk oversight. Welcome to all of you. Let me start off with the first round of interventions with a question for Lian Sim. Lian Sim, we know that TCFD has created standards for entities to disclose climate-related information to stakeholders. For the benefit of our audience, could you please tell us more about what TCFD is? Yes, thank you. And thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about TCFD. So the Financial Stability Board created the TCFD to develop recommendations on the types of information that companies should disclose so as to support investors, lenders, and insurance underwriters in assessing risks and pricing those risks and opportunities related to climate change. You can appreciate that if climate change was considered a risk far down the horizon, not enough would be understood or acted upon in good time with implications for financial stability. So they gathered this group of people and there are 31 of us. They're all from the private sector and have experience and skill sets which are relevant to the job. We come from various countries around the world. I think the important thing I'd like to highlight is that these are recommendations by the market for the market. So what users of information said was necessary and not more than that. And then what reporters of information said could be done, not necessarily easily, but could be done. That's what we alighted on. So that it's decision useful and relevant information and doesn't tax companies more than is necessary. The language and approach of TCFD recommendations is market speak, strategy, risk management, scenarios, metrics, targets, governance, all are familiar to companies and they also find their way in sustainability reporting and ESG. So I think that all these combine to make uh, TCFD recommendations implementable. Thank you, Lian Sim. But 
How widespread has TCFD become and how many organizations are supporting and disclosing under the TCFD framework? Right. So adoption is going on all the time. When we started in June 2017, uh, there were over 100 business leaders who pledged their support. And so these leaders, the companies that they came from had a market value of 3.5 trillion US dollars. And today you have 3,826 companies with market value of 25 trillion US dollars. And then in terms of financial institutions, uh, they, when we started, they had assets of $25 trillion. And now there are 1,459 financial institutions with assets of $216 trillion US dollars, representing 96 countries. It's widespread. With G7 supporting making TCFD recommendations compulsory, we will have statutory regulations coming in to mandate reporting. So I'd say that adoption can only increase further. It is reassuring to know that more and more companies and governments are showing support to the TCFD. In fact, we are very fortunate today to have Minister Seo from New Zealand, the first country in the world to introduce mandatory climate-related financial disclosures for the largest corporates. Minister Seo, perhaps you can share with us why New Zealand made TCFD reporting mandatory. Uh, kia ora, Teresa, and uh, tēnā koutou katoa to everyone. And, and I just want to thank the Asia Development Bank for organising the seminar and acknowledge you and all of you who are able to attend. Aotearoa New Zealand, um, we made TCFD reporting mandatory and there were essentially four primary reasons. The, the first one, and that was about investors, creditors and insurers did not have access to the information they needed. Uh, secondly, businesses were worried about being competitively disadvantaged if they were to reveal their climate related risks and opportunities before their competitors. They wanted a level playing field. And third, it was challenging to compare climate disclosures made under different reporting approaches. So some consistency was needed. And lastly, uh, the status quo was not driving change with sufficient urgency. So for us in New Zealand, it was vital for also for Pacific Island countries that we all take steps to green global finance to support staying within the 1.5 degrees and to ensure capital is flowing uh, to climate friendly investments. For New Zealand, this is a vital component in transitioning to a high wage, low emissions economy um, that provides security in good times and bad. For the Pacific, the impacts of climate change are very real and green finance can support efforts to build resilience to the climate change induced increase of risks from natural hazards. So I'd like to congratulate the Asia Development Bank both for taking the step voluntarily to make your first uh, TCFD disclosure and for all the work that you're doing on climate change and sustainability in our region. I'm also particularly excited by the ADB's first blue bond issuance in 2021, which was actually denominated in New Zealand dollars. Greater investments in enhancing and protecting the health of our oceans are vital, particularly for Pacific Island countries. Minister Seo, how has this decision been received by the market and different stakeholders? Well, Teresa, our decision to make TCFD reporting mandatory has been well received by stakeholders. We received increasingly positive support as the legislative process progressed and it culminated in 100% support from stakeholders we consulted with while the legislation was being drafted. Since introduction, the market has rapidly ramped up their processes, evaluation of climate related risks and opportunities and TCFD based reporting. It, it will take time. However, for those affected to build expertise in this space, but for instance, businesses have requested government support for increased climate data availability 
and support for the development of climate scenarios. Indeed, governments, corporations, and financial institutions play a vital role in driving climate reporting. Sustainability reporting is also important for the environmental agenda. Speaking of which, the Sustainability Report is the other publication we are launching today. Bruno, you are the one who heads the department responsible for the Sustainability Report. Perhaps you can tell us a bit more about it and what it covers. Thank you, Teresa. To supplement Duncan, and as President Massa highlights in the cover of the report, sustainability lies at the core of ADV's development agenda, including its Strategy 2030 and the Seven Operations Framework. ADB has been producing a sustainability report since 2007, and we are now on our ninth report. And currently, it is published every two years. The report provides information about ADB's on work on such things as promoting environmentally sustainable, inclusive growth. It is a means for ADB to inform stakeholders transparently and comprehensively about our activities on reducing our corporate footprint. And of course, as part of our commitment to greater disclosure of our work. Now, ADB's sustainability report, as you heard, uh, comes in two parts, a highlights report section and a detailed global reporting initiative for GRI. The highlights report gives an overview of our activities and sustainability achievements. It provides a platform to detail how the bank refocuses its activities to support our developing member countries, such as with our 19 responses and the subsequent green, inclusive and resilient recovery across the period 2020-2021. The GRI index is more of a technical document that gives a full picture of our governance strategy and operational and activities. It also reflects how these activities are sustainably managed and how it impacts communities and the environment. As I look out my window, I see the large number of solar panels across our white quarter rooftop as an example. Thank you. Bruno, may I ask, how does a sustainability report fit with a TCFD report? Uh, so the TCFD report complements the sustainability report. You could almost consider it as two sides of the same coin. The sustainability report discloses ADB's impact and footprint on people, the environment, and climate. Whilst the TCFD report discloses the ways that the climate impacts the risks and opportunities of ADB's operations, organization, and clients. Thank you very much, Bruno. Now I'd like to turn to Stephen. How do you think the TCFD report fits with the sustainability report? And can you tell us why ADB decided to become a TCFD supporter? Yeah, thanks, and Teresa. And it's, it's really great to be here. And I think I convey a sentiment of all of our colleagues here in commending uh, Minister Seo for um, New Zealand's leadership in this space. I do agree with Bruno that the publication of the sustainability report demonstrates a, a strong track record on sustainability and on climate reporting. And we have a very good story to tell. So now ADB is acting to strengthen our climate reporting further by disclosing according to the TCFD recommendations. And even though the Office of Risk Management actually started work on climate risk analysis back in 2020, there are a number of reasons that ADB has decided to become a more formal TCFD supporter, which we did last year. TCFD disclosure helps reinforce ADB's commitment as Asia and the Pacific's climate bank and the importance of our investments in climate mitigation and adaptation. Furthermore, adopting the TCFD recommendations with the help will help ADB in planning its operations to take advantage of opportunities and better, better manage climate-related financial risks. Disclosing also sends a strong signal to all stakeholders, including clients, that ADB supports greater transparency around climate risks and opportunities. Adopting TCFD reports, uh, reporting also helps strengthen ADB's environmental, social, and governance credentials. Climate financial risk analysis and ESG are becoming an increasing focus of external rating agencies in their credit rating assessments. And while ADB is not a regulated institution, rating agencies and shareholders do expect ADB to keep 
up with best practices in, in these areas. So TCFD is also moving from being a voluntary disclosure standard to becoming much more mandatory, as mentioned by the minister. Uh, international supervisors, such as the Balfour Committee and the G20's FSB, um, as well as regional and national regulators have become increasingly aligned with the importance of climate risk management and disclosure. So in a sense, ADB is getting ahead of the mandatory reporting standards by, by taking steps to disclose climate risks while, while still voluntary. We also hope that global movements from climate disclosure like um, TCFD will lead national regulators to enhance disclosure requirements for all types of organizations, particularly financial institutions, to support the gradual and orderly de-risking of the financial system. So in this regard, we want to help our developing member countries to implement TCFD and to be inclusive in this process. Back to you, Felipe. Thank you, Stephen. And I'd like to turn to Lian Sim. What changes have been made to TCFD reporting since the task force published its recommendation in 2017? Yes. So the 2017 recommendations are still in force. They're still the recommendations. The 11 areas to be uh, disclosed based on the four pillars, the pillars of governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. I think what has happened since then is the additional guidance produced. So some areas uh, were new or less um, adopted in the, in, in the beginning, hence additional assistance through guidance was necessary and helpful. So the first was climate scenarios. Scenarios are familiar to companies. Climate scenarios, perhaps not so much. So using climate scenarios to assess robustness of strategy. And that was first produced. In addition to that, we then followed up with integrating climate-related risks into the risk management processes of the company, rather than taking it as something separate, because it's part of the whole business of the company. Then thirdly, on metrics, targets, and transition plans. You understand that if there are targets, there must be plans, and these are the, it is the transition plans that already have financial impacts, and hence guidance on that. And then last year, we updated the implementation annex, which guides implementation of the TCFD recommendations. And in the process, uh, there were calls for uh, cross-industry metrics, which would be uniformly use, uh, useful in assessing climate change. And so seven of these categories were identified, and they include things like scope one, two, and three, GHG emissions, metrics on climate-related transition, physical risks and opportunities, uh, down to remuneration. Uh, so these are all things that can be used and are meant to be useful to companies and to uh, investors and users of the information because they are produced by those who are already dealing with the information. And you remember we started by saying adoption has been increasing every year. So every year the TCFD assesses about 1,500 of the largest listed companies with information that's available. And you'd be interested to know that the highest adopted is strategy. It's typical companies like to talk about and are concerned about their strategy. So climate related risk and opportunities impact in the short, medium and long term. And then secondly, it's the metrics used to assess these risks and opportunities. And then third comes the company's system for identifying and assessing climate related risk. If you go further down and dig a bit deeper, then we'll see that the financial aspects, disclosing the financial implications, if you like, and how it affects the business and the cash flow and their investment plans and so on, that has not been as much disclosed. So that provides room for improvement and room for work. If you're looking for tools and case studies, you, I would advise to look at the TCFD uh, Knowledge Hub on our website because that provides a lot of case studies and comes from companies already uh, doing the TCFD reports. And each year in our reports, we also quote examples of disclosures and work that has been done by companies. So these are all tools and useful um, information. 
as well outside. There are too many for me to uh, mention, but maybe I could say the UNEP uh, works with financial institutions and has made progress on that. And also for investors, there's the PRI, which works on responsible investment and have also been uh, looking at incorporating into their processes. Thank you, Lian Sim. Let me now turn to Minister Xiu to ask what's next for New Zealand? What are the lessons for other countries from the New Zealand making TCFD reporting mandatory? What's next for us in Aotearoa New Zealand? We're looking to expand the coverage of the mandatory disclosure regime uh, to more entities and to a broader range of climate reporting. Our, our current uh, situation is our climate related disclosure regime currently only covers around 200 of the country's largest financial market participants. We're now expanding, exploring, expanding our requirements to the public sector and large non listed uh, entities. In addition, uh, Aotearoa New Zealand currently only requires assurance over greenhouse gas emissions uh, to expand the range of reporting requirements. We're investigating whether to introduce assurance requirements over the whole of the entity's climate reporting. Um, as for imparting lessons, uh, there are three points uh, in particular that stand out for me in our experience. So the first one is engaging early and often with industry. That's crucial uh, to increasing buy-in, providing time for organizations to consider their strategy and begin data collection. I think the second one would be that international standard setting is rapidly evolving and engaging with international developments to ensure continued alignment will be vital. And lastly, I think governments must understand the role they can play to support entities uh, to disclose in line with the TCFD framework. Uh, significant education and data provision support may be required depending on the maturity of the market. I think this is where organizations like the Asia Development Bank could make a real difference as you work closely with developing countries to collect and analyze the sort of data needed to help governments to make informed climate risk based decisions and how to make that information available to all interested and affected parties should be considered if you want to make this sort of regime work as effectively and as efficiently as possible. Thank you very much, Minister Seo. Let's now go back a bit to how TCFD covers disclosure of climate-related risks and opportunities. Bruno, can you tell us some of the ways that the TCFD report covers ADB's strategy toward the opportunities presented by climate change? The, the strategy section of the TCFD report is, uh, as we've heard, one of four thematic areas along with governance, risk management and targets. It basically highlights a range of initiatives that show how ADB is taking action on climate change. From organizational strategies, such as our long-term strategy, Strategy 2030, to how climate change considerations are embedded into day-to-day -day operations. It also highlights the numerous ways that the ADB is supporting climate action in our developing member countries. For instance, promoting a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic is another great example of how climate change and the transition to net zero present opportunity in the region. ADB's TCFD report highlights various initiatives to support climate change opportunities within the bank's developing member countries. On the side, ADB's country partnership strategies are playing a role in ensuring that development projects selected for financing and eventually supported uh, on the downstream side are identified based on a robust understanding climate and disaster risks. Our work on climate is improving further upstream to identify adaptation policies that can inform ADB's pipeline and mainstream climate considerations and opportunities into the processes of our clients. A few other initiatives. In 2021, ADB launched the energy policy to set the stage for positioning ADB as the climate bank, including no to new coal projects. 
In 2021, we launched the Energy Transition Mechanism to help accelerate the retirement of coal plants and finance the transition from coal to clean energy and in, just, in a just and affordable manner. ADB also manages the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility, or ACGF, which is a green financing vehicle that supports governments in Southeast Asia to prepare and finance infrastructure projects that promote environmentally sustainable and contribute environmental sustainability, excuse me, and contributes to climate change. Next week, uh, we will be sharing with our board early work on the climate change action plan that underpins how we propose to operationalize this work. Let me also ask uh, Bruno another question. How do you think this can benefit ADB in its role as Asia and the Pacific's climate bank? The TCFD report uh, complements an important list of ongoing initiatives that uh, highlight ADB's role as the Climate Bank uh, of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, these include ADB's level of ambition to deliver $100 billion in climate financing over the period 2019 to 2030, as well as our commitments to align uh, the Paris Agreement and the development of a climate change, and, as I mentioned earlier that will continue to embed climate into ADB operations. Thank you, Bruno. I can see that there is a lot already happening and even more that is planned. Let me ask Stephen, perhaps you can also share with why TCFD reporting is an important risk management tool for ADB. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. Listen, you know, a benefit of adopting TCFD reporting is that it's helped the ADB to really closely examine our processes for assessing climate risks. Um, so, you know, we've had a climate risk management framework for reviewing physical climate risks on all projects since 2014. And for public sector lending, we've also, uh, our sovereign credit risk review also includes an assessment of exposures to physical risks and carbon transition risks. I'm pleased to say that we're at an advanced stage in the process of updating our sovereign rating model to more systematically capture climate risks through additional climate indicators. And for the private sector business, um, climate risk exposure is now reflected in the borrower, every borrower's internal risk rating using a set of rating templates. We've also recently introduced new limits to prevent, prevent growth in exposure to the fossil fuel energy sector as well as climate-based filter criteria that have been introduced for our treasury investments. Now, in the report, we've included some heat mapping of ADB's exposure to physical and carbon transition risks using project industry sector and country level analysis. We do need to undertake further analysis to examine this topic further. As sustainability and climate reporting evolve further, uh, we will continue to work to implement the latest best practices. Back to you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, looking forward to that. Um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have left. Um, thank you to our panelists for sharing their time and valuable insights this afternoon. It was really a very meaningful discussion, and I'm glad that ADB is at the forefront of climate change action. If you want to learn more about ADB's TCFD and sustainability reports, please visit the ADB website. And now, to formally close the event, I would like to invite ADB Vice President for Administration and Corporate Management, Mr. Bruce Gosper, for his closing remarks. Mr. Gosper has 40 years of experience working with multilateral and regional institutions, dealing with trade and economic policy, and running large public sector organizations. Over to you, VP Gosper. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, thank you for your moderation. And thank you also to our panelists and speakers for your insights and views on what is a highly interested and rele relevant topic to ADB as we seek to be the climate bank for Asia and the Pacific. So we've seen and heard examples of steps being taken by corporations, financial institutions and governments to increase the transparency of climate and sustainability reporting. Taking these steps has helped to build a culture where environmental and climate impacts are internalized and appropriately accounted for. Producing sustainability report and TCFD report are increasingly seen as industry standards. And these two publications demonstrate ADB's strong commitment 
and leadership in the topics of climate and sustainability, not only in our own operations, but in supporting ADB's developing country, member countries. <clears throat> As we've heard during the presentation and the panel discussion, the TCFD report details ADB strategies and risk management of climate-related impacts and opportunities. It also highlights ADB's progress against key climate and sustainability indicators through the metrics and targets section of the report. The inaugural TCFD report also complements the sustainability report, which provides detailed information on the economic, social and environmental impacts of ADB's operations and corporate activities. On the corporate side, the bank's greenhouse gas emissions have had significant reductions since 2014 from various initiatives, such as energy conservation in the headquarters and switching to wholly renewable energy, both off and on site. Residual emissions are typically addressed through annual carbon offsetting. Although the pandemic has had a positive impact on reducing ADB's greenhouse gas emissions by over 80%, this was primarily due to disruption and restrictions in international and local travel. Such gains are short-lived because business needs are expected to bounce back to pre-pandemic levels soon. Looking ahead, ADB will assess the impacts of its newly introduced flexible working arrangements and identify opportunities, including travelling smarter, to further reduce its carbon footprint. Sustainability is also about people and ADB can be proud of how we looked after our staff. The pandemic crisis management team implemented enhanced health coverage and medical support, additional flexible work and leave arrangements, various wellness programs and administered over 5,000 vaccine doses under ADB's vaccination program. ADB's organisational resilience program, which covers our internal structures, policies and processes, likewise incorporates environmental protection and sustainability best practices, as well as occupational health and safety, and all these benefit the ADB community. In closing the session, I would like to thank the event organisers and our distinguished panellists once again. Many thanks also to those that have joined us online for this event. Thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>